The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. The following program is closed captioned for the thinking impaired. By tomorrow, I will rule the world! <laughs> You think he's gone? He's not gone. That's the whole point. He's never gone. Is this some radical new therapy? You see? <laughs> well, I must have not been paying attention when you were just talking to me. Do you think that you could repeat the question? Internet is slow. It's got to fight with me. Of course. Every step of the way. Coming. I failed. Fired. Yeah. She didn't pop up. Get her out of here. She's done. That's your rule anyway, so. Yeah. <laughs> all right. It looks like we're up on all, all the places we need to be. Yay. Bye. There you right, go. There we go. Cool. Right. We can start the show now. <laughs> well, when you're ready. Oh, you st- you start the counter at the at the beginning of the song. All right. I didn't know that. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's get my notes up here. Wow. What a, what a full show we've got for people today. Ooh. All right. Let's start this shindig, shall we? Hi, my name is Tom Duggan here with the Paying Attention Podcast. Hi, at top two guys smoke shop at the Studio Twenty One Podcast Cafe. I think we're getting ready to celebrate our. Fourth anniversary, a fifth anniversary. Yeah, I think it's. Is it our fifth? Is that possible? I haven't been here that long. I think I'll it's our to go back and fifth. Check. It might be our fourth anniversary in oh. December. Um, yeah. Hi, how you guys doing? Appreciate uh, you paying attention to the Paying Attention podcast. Yeah. Um, I am in Facebook jail until five o'clock tonight. For those of you who are sending me such nasty emails and, and messages, why are you ignoring me? Are you mad at me? It's not about you. I say this all the time. If you send me a message, if you post something on my page and I don't answer it within a day or so, you should go to my page because I use my other, I have another account. I have an assistant who's got an account. He lets me use his when I'm in Facebook jail Mm -hmm. and I post on my page using his page to let people know if they go to my page. If you haven't heard from me in a while, go to my page on Facebook um, because uh, Bobby lets me use his account and then I'll go and I'll say, Tom is in Facebook jail. I do have a public page. Tom Duggan Jr. page. It's a public page and it's administered by my assistant. So when I go into Facebook jail, I can still use it and still get information out. So you should be following me on my on my page. You should be following me on my public page, which is the Tom Duggan Jr. page. I, th- I think they call it a celebrity page, but I hate to call it that because it makes it sound like I, I think I'm a celebrity, which I know I'm not. Um, so I'm in Facebook jail. A big shout out to my sister, Kiana, whose birthday was yesterday, I believe. Happy birthday, Kiana. Happy birthday. Although it could have been two days ago because I don't sleep. 
Yeah. So I can't remember because to me it's yesterday, but right. to other people it's two days ago. <laughs> um, also, I went to Borelli's Deli last week after the show. Oh, I love now, Don Smiriglio said to me, because the mayor of Methuen dimed me out, because that's the kind of guy he is, <laughs> um, that I complained that the sausage wasn't hot enough at Borelli's. So Don called me and he said, Tom, my sister is going to make a special hot sausage just for you. Oh. And I want you to come by after the show and let me know what you think. So I went by after the show. I bought a bunch of stuff. By the way, um, if you go to Borelli's, there's a couple of things that are now my go-to. And I picked up something new last week that I want to share with you guys. Tell me. Um, so I usually get the butternut squash ravioli. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a macaroni salad kind of guy, but their macaroni salad's really, really yeah. good. Mm-hmm. I got it by accident one day. I pointed to something, and I was actually pointing to the chicken salad. And the guy gave me, and he, the guy thought I was pointing to something else. So when I got home, I opened it, and I said, well, let me try it. It was amazing, right? Oh. But I found something new at Borelli's. I'm sure it's not new at Borelli's. It's just new to me. Yeah. Um, spinach and cheese ravioli. Ooh, I and I'm it. a big fan of spinach. It's one of the few it's one of the few vegetables I can eat. And I love spinach, so I said, "All right, let me get one of these." And I got halfway out the door and said, "You know what? Let me get two of these." And I went back and I got two. And I ate them for dinner that night with the sausage. It was just so amazing. And and I wish I could have been on Facebook bragging about it, but I'm in Facebook jail. Um so we want to thank Borelli. So I, he asked me, he said, let me know what you think of this because I can make it hotter, I can make it less hot based on you know, what you want. So I texted him and I said, oh my God, it was perfect. On a hot scale, I like hot sausage. On a hot scale from one to 10, it was like a nine. Right. It wasn't too hot that you couldn't enjoy it. Some places, they go overboard. They make it so hot that you can't really enjoy, excuse me, enjoy it. Yeah, well, you this was like hot. the perfect level of hot. So I texted him back and I said, Perfect level of hot, nine on a scale of one to 10. He said, my wife really liked it too. He said, from now on, I'm going to make it the special, it's going to be, it's going to be our, our go-to now. From now on, when people want hot sausage, this is the recipe we're going to use. So if you want that special Tom Duggan hot sausage, you go to Borelli's Deli and tell them, can I get the Tom Duggan special hot sausage? He awesome. said, we're going to do, do it for us. So I appreciate that. I'm gonna, after this show. I'll stop by Tomo's because I always like to stop right. and say hi to Aaron at Tomo's, and then uh, and then I'm going to go right to Borelli's to get my hot sausage. I might even get two of two of them. They're huge, um, awesome. because it, I mean, really, it is good. If you if you like hot sausage, now Borelli's Deli for hot sausage. This is the place to go. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll thank some of my other advertisers shortly. But we've got a really busy show. Yeah. Um, in Lawrence and Methuen and Haver, we had elections all week, right? And well, I say all week because to me, a day is like a week, right? Right. Um, Tuesday was the election, and um, I was expecting, and we came in and we said we were expecting that Kendrick Vasquez, uh, the acting mayor of Lawrence, was the front runner. After all, he is the acting mayor. Signs everywhere. He got endorsed by Dan Rivera, the former mayor. He got endorsed by State Representative Marcos Devers. He got endorsed by Elizabeth Warren. He got a, he endorsed, the entire Democrat apparatus in Boston got behind Kendrys Vasquez. No, you don't have to adjust it. Honey. We're, okay. I'm good. Um, got behind Kendrys Vasquez, and he was raising a ton of money, like a shit ton of money from outside the city. If you look at his campaign finance reports, the vast majority of money that Kendrys Vasquez was raising was from outside the city. Now, in North Andover, that works. In Methuen, that kind of works. In Andover, it definitely works. In Lawrence, that doesn't work. <laughs> In Lawrence, there's a there's and we talked about this on a previous show. There's there's an undercurrent of of um, I don't want to say hatred because that's the wrong word. Maybe resentment is the correct word. There's an undercurrent of resentment in Lawrence for outsiders, mm-hmm. people who are outside the city. And I get it all the time because I I don't live in Lawrence, but I report on Lawrence, and I constantly have people come on my page saying, "Well, you don't live here," as if somehow I did a bad thing by leaving. Like they all feel, you know, very upset about that that Tom Duggan left. While they're telling me they hate me, they're also <laughs> telling me that they're really mad that I left. I don't know why you want me to stay if you hate me so much, but that's the dichotomy you've got going on in Lawrence. So when Elizabeth Warren, when um, when big names outside the city, especially attached to the Democrat Party, come into Lawrence and try and affect the Lawrence elections, Lawrence people don't like it. They just don't. So we were expecting Kendris Vasquez, I was expecting Kendris Vasquez to walk away with this election. And every day I would be on, either on the phone or with Brian DePina, and I'd say to him, do you really think you can win this? Do you really think you can pull this off? And he'd say to me, Tommy, Tommy, no problem. 
<laughs> we go, we're going to win. We work hard. We're going to win. And I kept looking at them going, yeah, but, you know, the candidates always kind of say that, right? Like, right. they always think. But on election day, and this I've been, I've been saying this now for probably about 10 years, and it's totally true. On election day, whether it's school committee, city council, whatever it is the election is for, the candidates know on election day whether they've done what they needed to do or they didn't. They know whether they've got a disappointment coming or they don't. Now, they're not going to say that publicly because they've got to put on a good face. They want their, their supporters to to think that they think they're going to win, right? Because right. they've they, they got to think that they can win. And I kept looking at Brian and saying, are you sure you can pull this off? Like with this real doubt, because I'm watching on the ground what's happening. I'm talking, all my family lives in Lawrence. Most of my friends live in Lawrence. I'm in Lawrence, more than I'm in North Andover. And they're all saying, yeah, you know what? I think Kendris has this. And so I'm sitting here for weeks on this show saying Kendris is the, he's the front runner. He's the guy to beat. Wow. What an upset. Let's pull up the first set of numbers that we have right. on the Lawrence Mayor's race. What an upset on election day. Now, I was, I was, after the polls closed, I had to go to Methuen to get the Methuen numbers, which we'll talk about shortly. I went to, um, uh, I left there and I went to Lawrence City Hall first to see if I could get some kind of preliminary numbers. The small precincts usually come in first because there's fewer votes to count. And, I, and you can tell where those small precincts are, how well someone's going to do overall. So the first few precincts that I got was District A, and that is the Prospect Hill section of Lawrence. And Brian DePina won all four precincts. And I was shocked. I was shocked. I said, wait a minute. On all of Prospect Hill, all four precincts, Brian DePina won all four precincts? Oh, my God, he's got a shot. Hmm. And I started texting people saying, oh, my God, Brian DePina actually has a chance to win tonight. And, and, and all my Lawrence friends are going, no, don't worry about it. When B and C come in, when D comes in, when F comes in, Kendris is going to be fine. Of course, most of my, a lot of my friends, I wouldn't say most, but a, a lot of my friends, maybe most, were supporting Kendris Vasquez. So I had a really good handle on how they thought they were going to do. I had a really good handle on how Brian's people thought they were going to do. And I'm texting people and they're saying, uh, Kendris people, and they're saying, no, 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 don't worry. Don't worry about that, Tom. Kendris is going to pull this off. So I started posting the numbers, and I started just teasing out a little bit to the people who are following me, Brian's got a shot. And then all of a sudden, like within about 20 minutes, all the numbers came in all at once. And these are the numbers, and I, don't, I can't see that because that's too small, so I'm going to pull it up on my screen here real quick because I want to, yikes, Lawrence Mays race. So um, what I pulled up on the screen here is, on the left, you've got the primary results. On the right, you've got the final results from this week. Brian DePena, 6,093. Kendris Vasquez, 5,358. Shocking. Shocking to me. Shocking to Jack. The only person who wasn't shocked was Jackie Marmo. She was the one running around saying he's going to walk away with this. Don't listen to Tommy Duggan. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Brian DePena is going to win, and he's going to win big. And I didn't believe her because... She, Again, she's a Brian DePena supporter. She has to think that. Right. So I dismissed it. She turned out to be right. 735 votes was the difference between Brian DePena and Kendris Vasquez. Brian won every, well, he didn't bring, not every precinct, but he won every precinct except, pulled them up here, B4. B4, uh, the District B section of Lawrence is by the uh, North Common. That's the North Common Library area. He lost B4, a little surprising because the district councilor in B endorsed him, but he did win the first three. He won three out of four. In District C, he only won one precinct in District C, and that is where Kendris Vasquez lives. He's the former District C city councilor. So you can look at that two ways. Kendris Vasquez, as acting mayor, is the former district city councilor in District C, and he only won three of his own four precincts. Now, had I, seen that, had I seen the District C numbers first, had C come out before A, I would have looked at that and said, this election's over. If you can't take all four of your own home precincts in a mayoral race as the former district councilor in District C, you really have no shot. Right. But those numbers came out with all of the other numbers. I only had the A numbers first. So, he, so Brian lost and Kendris Vasquez won C1, 3, and 4. And in E and F... Kendris, uh, uh, Kendris Vasquez won three of the four precincts in E. I'm sorry. Kendris Vasquez won one precinct in E, one precinct in F. He won E1 and, e, e, and F1. 
Now, that was a little surprising to me. It was the only thing that surprised me on the other end. Because E1 and F1 are predominantly white neighborhoods. They are vastly predominantly white neighborhoods. And with the Willy Lantigua angle on this election, I would have thought those numbers would have been higher. However, however, Dan Rivera lives in Mount Vernon. Um, a lot of the uh, insider politicians that were endorsing Kendris Vasquez live in Mount Vernon or live in South Lawrence in the white neighborhoods. So um, to have E1 and F1 go to Kendris Vasquez, but not by a lot, not by a lot. Are these my Methuen? Yeah, those are my Methuen numbers. Um, I'm just going to quickly pull up the, lo- the E and F numbers. You don't have those, but I do. Um, uh, uh, crap. Sorry, I hate to do this while I'm live on the air. So looking at the E and the F numbers, like uh, F1, Kendris Vasquez, let's see, uh, Brian DePena, 234, Kendris Vasquez, 395. Actually, I had that reversed. How about that? E1. Brian DePena, 339, Kendris Vasquez, 441. That, that, when you look back at the primary numbers, Brian DePena got almost no votes in those two precincts. He did a lot better in those precincts than he did in the primary, and he did a lot better in those precincts than he did when he ran for at-large city council uh, two, four years ago when he was on the ballot. So those are your numbers for, for Lawrence, for the district, I'm sorry, for the mayor's primary and the mayor's final election. I'm trying, to do, I'm trying to do five things at once here, but just bear with me. Uh, God help me. I hate this computer. I really do. <laughs> Sorry. Where's my photo? Oh, I had it. It's gone. Okay. Um, so, all right. So those, are the, those were the, uh, the longs. 457 vote difference in the primary, and Kendris Vasquez came in first. Kendrick Vasquez came in first in the primary. Brian DePena was almost 500 votes behind him. So he made up the 500 votes that he was behind and another 737 votes on top of the fact that you had more people voting. Your total votes in Lawrence was 11,534. 11,534. I think that's correct, right? Do I have that right? In the final. Okay. Total registered voters, we have to do this, 11,934. All right. Um, your total vote, your total vote in Lawrence, can you pull up the one that says uh, LM2? Let me see what number that is. Crap. So that would be number four. Sorry, I know I was going to go in order, but mm-hmm. I just want to, because... My brain is, I had a brain fire. Okay, yeah, so you got these. You go. All right. New computer can't figure out where I am at any point. <sighs> Hi, how you guys doing? My name's Tom Duggan here with the Paying Attention Podcast. Uh, Lawrence Turnout, here we go. So your Lawrence Turnout, you had f- you, so that number's different. It's not 9,000. That was the primary number. It's 11,334 yeah. for a 28% turnout. Look at the number. Let's just stick with this number, even though it's, it's a little bit off. Um, so you have 42,105 registered voters in the city of Lawrence. 42,105 registered voters. That's about 40%, maybe 35% of the entire city. Right. 33,000 people stayed home. 33,000 registered voters did not vote in this election. Wow. 33,000. Now, you want to drive around Lawrence and you want to see why Lawrence is not what it should be? Since I was a kid... I was probably maybe nine or ten the first time I got involved in an election because my parents were very uh, actively involved. I remember people back then saying, wow, Lawrence has so much potential. Lawrence just has so much potential. And I've been hearing that now for 50-something years. And Lawrence still has great potential, but Lawrence has never achieved that potential. And this is why. This is why. 33,021 people stayed home. Let's pull up the at-large numbers if you can. That would be uh, number two. So in the outlaw race, you elect three in Lawrence. Um, the top three vote getters win. Um, in the primary, six get nominated. Three win to go on to the final. Pavel Payano, 6,025. Very odd that Pavel Payano would do that well given that he was supporting Brian DePena. That means that a lot of Kendris Vasquez people voted for Pavel Payano anyway, even though 
he was supporting Brian DePina. That, by the way, did not shake out for anybody else in this election. Brian, uh, Brian is, the, is the only one that we could see that, uh, I'm sorry, Pavel Payan is the only one that we can see that, that went against that rule. Then Anna Levy, 5,151, 874 votes behind Pavel Payano. And then Selena Reyes, who I have to tell you, I think this is her third term. I've never met her. I've been at every polling place. I've been at every political event. I've, I, I go to all the ribbon cuttings. I'm at City Hall on election night. I'm at City Hall on primary night. She's never once come over and said, hey, my name's Selena Reyes. I'm on the city council. You're Tom Duggan. I wanted to come over and say hi. Um, I've never met her. And quite frankly, um, if I saw her on the street, I probably wouldn't recognize her. I've seen her at city council meetings. I've watched the meetings a bunch of times. Um, but I don't think I would recognize her. She was 409 votes behind Anna Levy. So that makes her 12,000, I'm sorry, uh, 1,283 votes behind first place. Rich Russell, photographer for the Valley Patriot, a hero veteran, Vietnam veteran. I felt so bad for Rich. This was the only disappointment of the night for me. Rich Russell, 1,443 votes out of third place. He, I looked at the numbers. They give, you, they give you a spreadsheet like this. I don't know if you can see. It's this long spreadsheet um, that gives you all of, these, all of the numbers. And I looked at all of the precincts for Rich Russell. He came in fourth in every single precinct. Came in fourth in the white neighborhoods. Came in fourth in the Latino neighborhoods. Came in fourth in the Dominican neighborhoods. Came in fourth in the Puerto Rican neighborhoods. So I, 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 th- I think part of that is that People were just voting for the incumbents. The incumbents, 90, 90 plus percent of the time, 95 percent of the time, always win. And I think they were just going with the incumbents. I think most people that voted in the at-large race were really there to vote for mayor. And when it came to the at-large race, they just went down the ballot. Yeah. Right? They just said, okay, well, who are the incumbents? In Lawrence, it's a little different than in Methuen. In Methuen, you pick by lots where your position on the ballot's going to be. Yeah. Right, so if there's five people running, everybody picks a number, and even if your name ends with an A, if you pick five, your name is last on the ballot. In Lawrence, they go by, and I think Lawrence does it better. I think Lawrence is way better. They go incumbents are listed first, and then alphabetical by challenger. So it makes it a lot easier if you're a voter when you, if you go in to vote in Lawrence, you can look and see who. Are the, if it's a change year and you want to vote against incumbents, you vote against the people at the top three. Right? If it's a year where everybody is happy with what's going on, then they vote for the top three. And that, I think, is what happened here. Um, all right. So in the, in the District A race, let's pull up two. Well, you, you merged those, 2B and 2C, mm-hmm. right? Let's pull those up. Yeah. There you go. 17 minutes. Okay. So in the District A race, if you look at... Um, the side-by-side that she has. Let's do this. Very interesting. I wanted to bring in District A because those are the first numbers I had, so I had a little bit more time while I was waiting for the other election results to come in to kind of analyze these. Very, very interesting. In the district races, and I only used A, but A and C came out almost exactly the same. A and C were the only two uh, uh, district races in North Lawrence that were contested. In District A, the Prospect Hill neighborhood, Maria de la Cruz versus Richard Rodriguez. Now, I endorsed Maria de la Cruz, and it was hard for me to do that this year because she was the deciding vote against TMF staying at the bus stop to feed the homeless. And I really, I really wanted her to pay a small price for that, but I didn't want the price to be to have Richard Rodriguez take that seat. I've known Richard a long time. I've always liked him as a person. He should just never hold power. He's one of these woke left-wingers who thinks that everything's about racism. And we don't need that. Uh, Lawrence certainly doesn't need that. That's, that's part of the reason Lawrence is in the shape that it's in. But if you look side-by-side side here at the Brian DePena numbers in District A, which is what's on the left, Brian DePena in A1, 233 votes. Maria de la Cruz, who endorsed Brian DePena, 223 votes. Kendris Vasquez in District A1, 226 votes. Richard Rodriguez, who was with Kendris Vasquez, 198 votes. They paralleled each other in all four precincts, A1, A2, A3, and A4. They paralleled each other, which shows, what does this tell us? Why did I want to bring this in? Because what it shows is this district race was not decided based on who was running in District A. This district race was really decided based on who won the mayor's race. 
-hmm. Had Kendris Vasquez won, those numbers on the right that you see for the District A race, those would have flipped. It would have been the opposite. It would have been Kendris Vasquez in first, mirroring, I'm sorry, it would have been Richard Rodriguez in first, mirroring the first place votes of Kendris Vasquez. Do you guys understand what I'm saying here? And this is one of the reasons why I say, like, when you look at the election numbers, there's so much in there that you don't realize until you start looking at it and dissecting it. I spend about five hours looking at these numbers, and, and I know I'm a geeky guy. Like, this is like Christmas for me. Yeah. When I'm, when I, when election time for me is like Christmas time because it tells you a lot. It tells you a lot about what's going on in those neighborhoods. It tells you a lot about what's going to happen in the next few years in Lawrence or in Methuen or anywhere else. The election numbers, especially when you look at the breakdowns by precinct, show you kind of where things are going to be going, for where the priorities are going to be, where, what, where things are going to be two years from now. Um, there was a ballot question in Lawrence. Now, this is going to be hotly contested. Um, this would be whatever the next uh, screen is, which would be the B2, this would be uh, graphics three. Sorry, Chris. That's okay. Let me bring it up. So there's a ballot question in Lawrence. Mm -hmm. Should they override Proposition 2.5? Proposition 2.5 is a state law that says that there's no municipality can raise property taxes by more than 2.5% in one year. And if for some reason you need to raise the property taxes more than 2.5% for that year, you have to put it on the ballot. You have to have a Prop 2.5 override. And if the voters say, okay, you can raise our taxes a little bit more because, in this case, um, we're building, we, they want to build a school, the Leahy School in Lawrence. Um, in North Andover, we had a Prop 2.5 override vote to build a new police station. So after the, city, after the town budget was done, town fathers got together and said, we need a new police station, and this is what it's going to cost. We don't have enough money in the budget for it. We need a Proposition 2.5 override. They put it on the ballot, which in North Andover is at town meeting. And I believe it passed. That was probably about five years ago. In Lawrence, they're looking to build a new school. They're looking to build a new Leahy school. And let me tell you this. You know I'm not a fan of the teachers' union in Lawrence. You know I'm not a fan of the teachers' unions in general. And I'm not really a big fan of public teachers to begin with. This failed. This failed 4,925 by 4,696. That's 229 vote difference as to whether or not the property taxes in Lawrence got raised. Why did this fail? I've always been a big supporter of raising taxes in Lawrence because I believe, as we talked on previous shows, people in Lawrence don't kick in enough for what they're spending. All right? You have a 300, I think Rich was here, he said a $350 million budget in Lawrence. $45 million of that is local taxes. The rest, the other $310 million or $305 million comes from the state and federal government. So Lawrence is not paying their fair share for what they're spending. And so normally when there's a Prop 2.5 override in Lawrence, I'm the first guy to say, yep, raise the taxes. Raise the taxes in Lawrence, they're not paying enough. However, the teachers' union got involved. And the teachers' union in Lawrence decided they were the ones that were going to spearhead this, and they wanted, a new high they wanted a new Leahy school. Not for the children, for the teachers, the teachers want a prettier building to work in. The teachers want a better building to, to educate our kids or not educate our kids as the, as the case happens to be. So my understanding, a little birdie told me yesterday that they, they had a meeting, and I did not get this from Brian, but that they had a meeting with Brian DePina yesterday to talk about whether or not they were going to contest those numbers, whether they were going to ask for a recount and contest those numbers. Here's what I will tell you about that. I have been involved in no less than a dozen recounts in the city of Lawrence. Lawrence loves recounts, especially in the district races. A lot of these district councilors, they, they win by 20 votes. They win by 12 votes. They win by 15 votes because in the district races, especially if there's no contested mayor's race or if the mayor is going to be a blowout like uh, when Dan Rivera ran the second time around, they know that those district races are going to have very few people voting. The, the turnout's going to be very low. So I remember when Nuzio Demarca called for a recount. I remember when Israel Reyes called for a recount. I remember several times Willie Lantigua called for a recount. With 20-something thousand voters or 11,000-something voters, you only see a swing of about three to nine votes on a recount. And that's usually because maybe somebody didn't feed their ballot in properly or the machine just didn't pick it up or you didn't fill in the oval correctly so it might not have read it correctly. But when they do the recounts in Lawrence, and again, I've done at least a dozen or two dozen of those, 
where I actually had to sit there for hours and hours and watch the process. At the end of all of that, there's only like a three to nine vote swing. So if the teachers union wants to contest this election for the Prop 2.5 override for a new Leahy school, they're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to flip 229 votes, which is actually, uh, I don't know, what's two, two, let's, let's call it 230 for an even number. So it's, what, 115 votes? So they would, yeah. need to, they would need to take 115 votes away from yes and give it to no for no, um, to give, take away from no and give it to yes for yes to now win. It's nearly impossible, if not impossible, to swing 115 votes, even citywide, on a recount in Lawrence. It, it just is. Now, if there were write-in votes involved, if this was like a write-in type campaign, then I would say, yeah, 115 votes, you could make that up. Because a lot of times people will write the name in and not circle the oval. And when they do the recount, if they see the name written in, it's the intent of the voter, and they will count that as a vote, even though you didn't circle the oval. So if this was a write-in type situation, I could see that. I don't see it here. I just don't. Oh, God, you're telling me this is getting nine minutes left? Seriously? All right, what else do we have? Uh, we did the long, long turnout. Let's pull up the video. So on election night, we all find out Brian wins. It was just may. It was just mayhem. It was mayhem at, at, on, on Broadway in Lawrence. It was mayhem on Essex Street in Lawrence. It was mayhem at the Brian De Pena headquarters, if we could pull that video up. Yeah. Um, so I left City Hall once I, once I got, like, the full numbers started coming in. They weren't released publicly, but a friend of mine in City Hall texted me the numbers. Somebody who works in the election department, I want to thank that person profusely because it helped me do my job better, right? And so went to Brian headquarters and then followed him to City Hall. The video that you're watching is him arriving at City Hall. And I want, I want you guys to watch the excitement and the jubilation that's going on in Lawrence. Now, say what you want about Lawrence, but they care about democracy. They care about elections, and they care about the people that they vote for. It's not Methuen, trust me. We're going to talk about that in whatever five minutes we're going to have left when I get to it, right? But here's Brian walking into City Hall. You can pull that up a little bit. It takes him nearly 10 minutes to get where he wants to go to make a speech. Yeah. Because he had to stop and hug every... I thought I was watching Nancy. He had to stop and hug every single person he met. You can pull that down a little bit. You can leave it up on the screen if you want. So I, I'm in the middle of all of this. I'm obviously, I've got, I've got great access because Brian is a friend of mine, and I love that. Unlike, unlike mayors in other communities that I've helped, he's actually grateful for the help that I gave him. And um, he, he grabbed me in the middle of election day. I was at the Frost School. No, I was at the South Lawrence East School. And he said, Tommy, tonight, if we win, I want you by my side. I want you. Hmm. I want you live. I want you, to go, I want, I want you there. So normally I send Rich Russell to do this kind of stuff, but he was actually on the ballot. So I, so I said to him, you know what? I will be there. And that's why we got such great access, and I appreciate Brian for doing that. But I wanted to show you this because I wanted to give you a comparison. When was the last time you saw this kind of excitement? When was the last time you saw this kind of jubilation over an election in Methuen? Like, never. Like, never. Like, even on election night when Neil Perry won with 71% of the vote two years ago, I showed up at his, his victory party after. You didn't have that kind of jubilation, yeah. Yeah. right? When Steve Zani won um, his, his big contested race the first time, there wasn't that kind of jubilation. Even when, the, only, the last time I saw that kind of jubilation in Lawrence was Billy Manzi. And that was, I think he was mayor, what, back in 2000, uh, I'm going to guess, nine, maybe, mm. right? So I wanted to show that because I had several people say to me that night and the day after, we care, more about, we care more about our elected officials and our democracy than the people of Methuen. And I was, I was really surprised at how many people were pissing on Methuen in Lawrence. They're like, hey, you know what? In fact, Kevin Druin, who was at TMF last night, came over and said, hey, you know what? 
Lawrence might have a lot of problems. We've got our issues, but at least we're not Methuen. Did you see the, the excitement? Did you see the jubilation? Did you see? He said, we care more about our democracy than Methuen does. Methuen just reelected all of their elected officials. Everybody on the ballot that was an incumbent, they all won. Every single one, not one challenger won. He said, here in Lawrence, we like to mix it up. And I thought, wow, you guys in Methuen, you got to step up your game. Because when people in Lawrence are making fun of you, <laughs> you've got problems beyond what you think you have. Yeah. And, you know, it's been a long time since I've heard people in Lawrence mocking or, or making fun of anybody in any other community. Because Lawrence is usually considered like the worst community in the, in the state. And now they're mocking Methuen. Let's look at why. Let's take, pull up a clip, no, I mean, uh, graphic number hey, five. So this is your at-large race in Methuen. Now, in Methuen, didn't have a lot of jubilation. Uh, you didn't have a lot of people turn out to vote. By the way, twice as many people in Lawrence. Uh, that's not true. It's not twice as many people. Lawrence had a 28% turnout. Methuen had an 11% turnout. All right? So that, that tells you something right there. So you had DJ Beauregard. Now, in this at-large race, my thought was, and I said this on the show, and I'm happy to be wrong. I know a lot of people like to throw in your face, Tom, you are wrong about something. That doesn't hurt me. I don't mind being wrong. I'm happy to be wrong. Because then, then I learn something for the next time around. I learn, like, you know, how to evaluate better for next time. Uh, Joyce Campignon, who was here, she came in last. She was 670 votes out of third place. The top three get elected. It's a vote for three. DJ Beauregard, I believed, I believed, the DJ Bora guy was going to be fighting for third place. Jessica Finicaro is in with the veterans and the seniors. They love her. I figured she would top the ticket. Nick DiZaglio, his name is DiZaglio. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a legendary name in Methuen. It, it's a legacy name. Mm-hmm. You get Diana DiZaglio as your state senate. You've got, you've got former mayor DiZaglio. You've got Ryan DiZaglio on the school committee. You've got Nick DiZaglio on the city council. DiZaglio is a, 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 a legacy name in Methuen. Nick should have been in second. By all right, it should have been Jessica first, DiZaglio second, and DJ Borgard in third because DJ, brand new to the council, didn't have a big base of support among the elderly, didn't have a big base of support among the veterans when he first got elected. He kind of got a hodgepodge, and he came in third two years ago. Wow, what a difference. DJ jumps from third place two years ago up to first place with 2,538 votes. Jessica, uh, 80 votes behind with 2,458 votes. Why did that happen? I'm going to tell you why it happened, even though I don't like it. I'm going to tell you why it happened. Because DJ Borg got grandstanded during the Joe Solomon situation. He knew how to play the voters. He gets coached by Billy Manzi, and Billy Manzi has coached him tremendously. In fact, really, at this point, Billy Manzi is the city councilor at, at Lodge. It's not really DJ Borg. He, he takes his marching orders. And, um, and in most cases, I would say that's not a bad thing, because Billy Manzi is a pretty smart guy. He's actually a very good friend of mine. And I will never, ever say anything negative about him publicly, which is why I've kept my mouth shut on this DJ Beauregard thing that I've got going with him, right? Um, I haven't called Billy and said, hey, can you call off the dog? Can you get your guy off my ass? I didn't do any of that, right? I just kind of let it be, let it be what it is. If DJ wants to come after me, if he wants to do the stuff that he's done, let him do it. And, you know, down the road, something, karma, it's going to come back and get you. DJ Borg got 20, 2538, Jessica Finnecaro 2458, Nick DiZoglio, 1,000, I'm sorry, 2,110. I'm, I'm going to ask for a little bit of extra time because I really want to talk about this for a couple seconds. Nick DiZoglio came in last, and I'm going to tell you why he came in last. Neil Perry doesn't like him. Neil Perry's people were out there pushing for Joyce and pushing for DJ Beauregard. And it worked for DJ Beauregard because DJ had grandstanded tremendously during the Joe Solomon scandal. He was up there throwing bombs at the table. He was using inflammatory language. And the voters eat that up. You know, I don't like that kind of stuff because it's pandering. However, politicians pander because it works. Here's the numbers. That's the proof. The proof is DJ Beauregard went from third place three years ago, a total unknown, to topping the ticket this year. And that's because of A, Joe Solomon, and B, Neil Perry. But he didn't do too good, Neil Perry. And the coattails for Neil Perry, I think it's, it, we end up looking at a 50-50. He helped DJ Beauregard get in, but he did not knock out Nick DiZaglio. And I think one of the reasons for that is we had Joyce here two weeks ago. Her, her husband died like nine days before the election. And she couldn't go out and campaign. Like, how do you knock on someone's door when they know your husband just died and ask somebody for a vote? And even though I told her she should do it anyway, she said, no, I'm, I, I just can't. I can't do it. 
I'll knock on someone's door who knew my husband and I'll break down crying and I won't be able to handle it. So she didn't get a chance to actually get out and do the signs that she should have done. She didn't make the phone calls she should have made and she didn't go door to door. Had her husband not died nine days before the election, I think this could have been a little differently. But I would have been wrong. Joyce Campagnon would not have knocked out DJ Beauregard. She, he, she would have knocked out Nick DiZaglio. And, um, and instead, she is, uh, and she said this is her last time running, so I don't think we're going to see Joyce Campagnon again. Let's go to the next, uh, the next, there you go. Um, so in the West District, this was the only district race contested in, in Methuen. It was Mike Samad, Ali Safi, and Mike Downs fighting for two seats. So in Methuen, you've got three districts, and you've got two councilors represent each district, so you can vote for two. Mike Samad, 1,121, he tops the ticket. We knew that was going to happen. He's very popular. People like him. Um, he's, a, he's a hero police officer, and he does a lot of favors for a lot of people. And so that does not surprise me. We said from day one he was going to come in first. Ali Safi, which I, I, I apologize, Ali, for, uh, for the typo with the D at the end of your name. It's Ali Safi without a D. 796 votes. Look at Mike Downs. He did everything right. He did everything right, and, and with all due respect to Ali Safi, she did everything wrong when it comes to what you're supposed to do during a campaign. And yet, Mike Downs lost by 50 votes, and I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Because Mike Samad and Ali Safi were working together. Mike, Mike Samad loves Ali Safi, and by the way, it's hard not to love Ali Safi. She's an incredible person. Like, forget the politics, she's just a nice person. And she's not one of the people that sits up at grandstands um, like DJ Borogod does. If she did, her numbers would be bigger. If she grandstanded like Mike Samad did, her numbers would be bigger because pandering works. It just does. As much as I might hate it, the voters love it. So Mike Downs, I think had he worked a little harder, he could have made that up. Um, I think if, um, if we had a different dynamic going on in Methuen, he could have made that up, but he ended up not... Uh, he ended up not being successful. I do want to take a look down at the bottom real quick. So you had 668 blanks, and that's because if you look at Mike Samad's numbers, if you add uh, Ali Safi's number and the blank numbers, you almost get Mike Samad's number, right? That's because somebody. That's because half of the people who voted for Mike Samad bulleted Mike Samad. Samad. They didn't vote for Mike and Ali. They just voted for Mike, which counts as one vote for Mike and one blank. And that's why the blanks are so high. You had one write-in, and then I did a breakdown at the bottom here. Registered voters in the west end of Methuen. 12,000. Is that right? That can't be right. That can't be right. There's no way there's 12,000 voters in the west end of Methuen, so I'm going to skip that. Let's go to the next one. Here's your registered voters as we wrap up the show. So your registered voters in Methuen, 36,762 registered voters. At least as of what uh, Jack Wilson, great guy, city clerk in Methuen, gave me election night. It was nice catching up with him, too. I haven't seen him in about 20 years. Uh, we used to work together in Lawrence City Hall back in 1986, which tells you how old I am. You had 36,762 registered voters in Methuen. You had 4,051 turnout. Yikes. You had 4,000. That's 11%. That means 32,711 people in Methuen didn't give a shit. That means 32,711 people didn't care enough to even vote by mail, to even vote by absentee, to stop by on their way to work or stop by on their way home from work to vote in, in the West End District of Methuen. That's shameful. And I have to tell you, and nobody's going to listen because everybody in Methuen has their head up their ass when it comes to elected officials. They all think they're smarter than me and you and everyone else, so they never listen to any advice. Unlike Lawrence, where they listen to advice all the time, which is very refreshing. Um, this, Methuen is, is, is careening toward becoming Lawrence. It's careening toward, it's, it's heading over the cliff toward becoming Lawrence, and this number here shows you why. It's because 88, almost 89% of the people who are registered to vote just in the West End District alone, because that's the only contested race, they stayed home. They stayed, no, this is the... Um, Ah, sorry, this is the overall numbers. Overall in the city, 88% of the people, almost 89% of the people in the city of Methuen stayed home. Shameful. Shameful. Even if you were in the East End and everybody in the East End was uncontested, 
Go out, go to go to the election polling and leave your ballot blank if you don't like the. the g- call City Hall and say I want an absentee ballot and leave it blank. Sign, leave everything blank. Put it in the envelope. Sign it and send it in. Instead, eighty nine percent of the people stayed home. Now, the optimist would say that's because people in Methuen are happy with what's going on. When people are happy, they don't go out to vote. You only see a high turnout when people are unhappy. A low turnout always helps incumbents. A high turnout always helps the challengers, right? There's very few exceptions to that rule. So the optimist would say, yeah, this is because people in Methuen are happy with the direction. And I think that's probably true. Look, Mayor Perry had no opposition. He got, I think I did the math, it was like 82% of the vote, which is higher than he got last time around. A little surprising. I'm going to redo the numbers when I get back home. Um, But... You had so few people turning out in, in Methuen. So few people turning out in Methuen. It was really kind of sad. I drove around on election day. I went to the District F, pre- uh, the uh, West District Precinct. Um, you had maybe 15 people holding signs. You had a higher turnout than everywhere else. I went to the other two precincts, the other two districts. You had maybe four or five people holding signs. That was it. Very interesting, though. I didn't see Neil Perry, and I didn't see any Neil Perry people holding signs in any of the places that I went. That may have just been because when I went, they weren't there. They may have been there other times during the day, but I didn't see them. Mayor Perry has announced, he announced it on this show a year ago when he announced that he was running for re-election, that he was not going to run for a third term, which means he's, he is, as of right now, a lame duck. And you're going to be able to tell that by the way the counselors start treating him because coming up in two years, you're going to have Nick DiZoglio running for mayor. You're going to have DJ Beauregard running for mayor. You're going to have Steve Saber running for mayor, and you're going to have Jessica Finacaro running for mayor. And those are just the ones that we know about. There's going to be other people, I'm sure, jumping in. It's going to be an open seat because Neil Perry said he's not going to run. And he gave his word, so we know he's going to keep it, right? So I know we're over. I know you've got some place to be. Um, um, let's see. just want to make sure I didn't forget anything. I did ask the Brian DePina people why they thought they won on election night. They said two things. They said, actually, they said three things. They said, we had an endorsement from, from the firefighters, number one. They said the Lantigua endorsement of Kendris Vasquez finished him off at the end. And um, the flyer that, that uh, Kendris Vasquez sent out attacking Brian DePena's wife, ex-wife, and ex-girlfriend uh, started the ball rolling toward, uh, toward a win for Brian DePena. So I... Um, I think that's all we got. Time is up. You can roll up, Melvin. I'll thank my sponsors. So I was a little off my game today. I thought we were going to be a little smoother giving you these numbers. But hopefully I did it slow enough so that you understand it. That's really all I really care about. It doesn't really matter what, how I look. Where is it? All right. We want to thank our sponsors. McLennan Real Estate, Century 21 on Broadway and Lauren in Broadway and Methuen. AFC Urgent Care. Lisa Williams is going to be here next week. Uh, from AFC Urgent Care, Marsane and Sun Construction, EIS Investigations and Gun Training, Borelli's Deli, where I'm going to get my super hot Tom Duggan sausages after the show, Tomo and Happy Crab, Clear Path for Veterans, New England, Pleasant Valley Landscaping, Dave Id Consoli. We're going to get him back on the show. He's a lot of fun to have. Uh, the Great Alliance Technical School, and a special shout out to Brian DePena, who actually sponsored the show to say thank you to the voters today. It's been a long time since any elected official has done that. Mr. DePena, you showed class. You showed class that no one in Lawrence or Methuen has shown in 30 years. I'm glad you're the mayor of Lawrence, and I'm looking forward to having you back before November November is over. Chrissy, thank you for a fine, fine show today. You're welcome. Melvin Taylor says you got to go home, so go home already. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.